Hey, happy Sunday, everyone. I'm so glad you're joining us today for church. I hope you're tuning in with some amazing people. I just want to take a moment to welcome you. I'm so glad you're here. My hope today is that as we have church together, as we watch this message together and worship together, that we encounter Jesus, that you encounter Jesus in your homes, and that it leads you to loving people more. If you're wanting to join with us today in giving, you can do that. There's uh, all the information at communitygospelchapel.com slash giving. We're so excited that today after the service, one o'clock, we're meeting at Fernwood Dock for baptism. Daniel Logan is getting baptized and we want to celebrate with him. I guarantee you it's the most exciting thing that's happening today, so don't miss it. Uh, you can bring a picnic lunch afterwards if you'd like to eat on the beach, but we want to invite you to come and celebrate together at Daniel's decision through baptism to follow Jesus. Also, this week, Tuesday, we have mops happening at 7 o'clock p.m. If you are a mother of a preschooler, you're welcome to join that. Please contact Gloria for more information. Also this week, we have on Wednesday, our Wednesday night worship, 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, please let us know if you'd like to come. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, we've had such amazing times of just praying and worshiping together. And so you can uh, send us a message, send me a message at micah at communitygospelchapel.com if you'd like to join. Also on Thursday this week, we have our Grow Night. We're going to be having safe people running. We're going to be having Building Strong Foundations running. And we're actually going to be having a Youth uh, Alpha, which is going to be running as well. So we want to invite you to that. Uh, come join in. If you know somebody who would like to be a part of that, you can contact the leaders or you can contact me directly. Uh, to find out more information and all of those are going to start at 7 p.m. at the church. So we're going to have three different grow groups, uh, two grow groups and a youth group happening Thursday starting at 7. We're calling it our grow night and we're so excited for what God is going to do in your lives as you gather together and, uh, and go deeper as you grow in your walk with Jesus. And finally, the next gathering is going to be taking place the first Sunday of November. Uh, we're going to be sending out a sign-up to register soon, so uh, keep your eyes open for that. Also, if you're wanting to give to our heating uh, project for the church, we are almost at our goal. I think we're, we're a few thousand out still. If you would like to contribute to that, you can do that uh, using the giving options and just put a note or a memo to the building fund, and we'll make sure it gets there. All right, I want to pray for you guys as we start, and then we're going to jump into the message here in a minute. Jesus, thank you for every person gathering today. Pray a blessing over them in their homes, right where they are. I pray that you would speak to them, that today's message would inspire us to be your church and to move with you. So Holy Spirit, we just welcome you into our homes today. In Jesus' name, amen. A number of weeks ago, I heard a question that really stuck with me, and so I wanted to address it. And the question was this, if we're not in the building, then why would we tithe? And so today I want to address this question, I want to address the topic of tithing, but I actually want to go a lot deeper than that. I want to do a deep dive into the heart condition, the, uh, where our hearts are at when it comes to the topic of tithing and surrender and the Lordship of Jesus in our lives. You see, I believe in tithing. I believe that it is a biblical principle and that it is for believers today. Some people would tell you that it's an Old Testament principle, an Old Covenant principle. 
it, while it is Old Testament, it is not Old Covenant because it was actually started by Abraham. In Genesis 14, Abraham comes across a king. He's known as the king of righteousness, of the city of peace. And his name is Melchizedek or Melchizedek. And it says that Abraham takes one-tenth of all the spoils of what he had recovered and he gives it to Melchizedek. Now this is such an interesting passage because what need does a king have? A king has already wealth and, and Abraham is just starting out and yet he gives a tenth of all that he has brought in. Why? To honor the king. You see, like I said before, I believe in tithing. I believe that it's a concept for us today. Uh, tithe just simply means one-tenth, ten uh, percent oh, of what we produce. And in today's society, that would be one-tenth of our finances. But actually, when it's outlined in the Old Covenant, it carries over from Abraham through the Old Covenant. It's actually one-tenth of everything that Israel produced. There was their goats, their sheep, their firstborn children, their finances, their wheat, their cattle. They were called to tithe, the, the, not just one-tenth, not just the last tenth, but the best, the first. And so I believe that this is actually a principle for followers of Jesus today. You see, tithing is the only place that I know of, giving, giving God 10%, is the only place I know of where God actually makes the 90% that's left more effective than the 100% altogether. That when we choose to give Him first, give Him the best, that He will bless that which remains. And I've seen this in my own life where as we have committed, I've, I have followed this principle since I was a young boy, probably as eight, nine years old. I was always taught that, that tithing was something that you did right off the top. And I've seen God's provision, financial provision in my life, in the life of our family. You see, I don't do it to try and earn God's favor or to earn his blessing. I don't do it. I don't, I don't believe that is the, the purpose of tithing. In fact, I would say even if you were tithing for that purpose, you're probably doing it from a religious mindset. I would even say that if you're giving to a, a church, believing that you were paying for the building or paying for the pastor, that you're actually doing it for the wrong reason. You see, it's not about paying for a service. It is actually about honoring God for who he is. That is what this concept is about. And we see it outlined first with Abraham where he honors Melchizedek, who some people believe was Jesus meeting with Abraham. He honors him not because he needs it, but because he is king. He honors the king for who he is. And that is what giving, living generously, tithing is actually all about. It's about honoring the Lord. Does he have a need for your money? No, absolutely not. He doesn't need, in the old covenant, he didn't need goats. He had no need for them. There was nothing that he needs. He is the king of the universe. But what a shame if we don't bring him the honor that he's due for how great he is. You see, I've never heard somebody say, well, I don't believe in tithing so that they could be more generous or give more honor to God. I usually have heard it in the context of, well, this is mine and, and I want to keep it for myself. It's often about finding a loophole to be less generous, not to be more generous. And so where I want to go today is I want to ask you, how do we bring God the honor that he is due, what he is worthy of? How do we honor Jesus in our lives, in our finances, in our time, in our energy, with our families? How do we bring God the honor that is due his name? We're going to start today looking in Malachi. Malachi is the last uh, prophet before the time of Jesus. We're going to start in Malachi chapter 1. We're going to read from Malachi chapter 1. We're going to read verses 6 to 12. The Lord of heaven's army says to the priests, A son honors his father and a servant respects his master. If I am your father and master, where are the honor and respect I deserve? 
you have shown contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we ever shown contempt for your name? You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you ask, how have we defiled your sacrifices? How have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When you give blind animals as sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer sacrifices that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Go ahead, beg God to be merciful to you, but when you bring that kind of offering, why should he show you favor at all, asks the Lord of Heaven's armies. How I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, and I will not accept your offering. But my name is honored by people of other nations from morning till night. All around the world they offer me sweet incense and pure offerings in honor of my name. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. You see, maybe you know Malachi. Uh, one of the famous ones is Malachi chapter 3, where God tells the people of Israel, this is kind of the conclusion of, of what he's talking about here. And in conclusion, he says, bring the full tithe into my, into my house, and I will open the windows of heaven and pour out more blessing than you can, than you can contain. He ends this idea with a blessing if we will respond to him. And, and there are promises of God that are like that. They're conditional on our response. And I'm so thankful that, that as we read this passage in Malachi, we can read it through the grace and the mercy of Jesus. Not as a religious duty, but as an inspiration to become more like Jesus. You see, I want to ask you today, is your attitude when it comes to following Jesus, is it more about what is good for you and what blesses you? Or is it about bringing honor to his name? Honoring for him for who he is because he is so incredibly worthy. Honoring Jesus because Jesus came and gave up his life. He gave up everything. He gave up heaven to come and put on flesh just so that he could give up his life. Die on a cross for your forgiveness, for my forgiveness, for every single wrong choice, every single sin, every time that we chose to partner with sin so that we would experience God's forgiveness, that we could actually be made right in His eyes. And I wonder, are we, just like the people of Israel that Malachi is talking about, do we compromise our sacrifice before God? You see, sacrifices were meant to be pure, and set apart. They were meant to be the best of the best. And God's challenge here was, are you offering something less than the best? Is the sacrifice that you are bringing to Him? In, in Romans a few weeks ago, we talked about living lives of sacrifice. That we are to be living sacrifices. It's no longer about a goat or a sheep that we bring. It's about how we bring our lives to God. How we bring our finances to God. How we bring everything that we have to Him. Are we bringing things that are contemptible? Or are we bringing things that are pure and holy and set apart? Holy just means set apart. What are we bringing Him? How are we honoring who He is? You know, so often we act like Jesus is so small that He just takes up a small piece and we can kind of accessorize with Him. You know, yeah, He gave up His life for us and I want to accept that forgiveness, but I don't want, really want to bring my life into conformity with who he is. I don't want him to tell me what to do or how to do it. I want to do what I want to do. I want to accessorize with Jesus. But that isn't right. Because Jesus isn't something you can accessorize with. He is the king of the universe. He is everything. He is the beginning and the end. He is the fullness of God. You cannot accessorize with fullness when you invite Him into your life. You see, somewhere along the lines we believe this lie that our heart is like a mansion full of many rooms and it's this elaborate palace and labyrinth and we allow Jesus into one part and, and He slowly takes over the rooms of our lives. But about a week ago, uh, we celebrated the, the Jewish festival of Sukkot. 
Sukkot is the festival where the Jewish people came to celebrate God tabernacling with his people. You see, traditionally, every family at Sukkot would set up a tent in their backyard. It would be made of palm branches, and they'd put a table in there. That's where they would eat their meals. And many people still to this day will actually sleep out there for the period of that week. And it's a remembrance of God tabernacling with his people, coming to live with his people. This is how we should be thinking about our hearts, not as an elaborate mansion with all these rooms, but as a simple tent. That when we invite Jesus in, there's not another room for him to explore. We give him everything. And my life then is not a a process of surrendering different rooms to him, but at the point that I come to him, I surrender everything. And then in my life, as I encounter different circumstances, as I grow, uh, as as I move through life, I'm continually faced with a chance to to follow up on that original decision. It's not a new room for him to, to me, for me to surrender to him. It is a continuation of that original decision to allow him to have everything in my life. For example, before we had kids and before I was married, I surrendered my life to Jesus. At a young age, I gave my tent to him. I said, Jesus, I want to follow you and I want to commit to following you every day forward from here on out. It wasn't a one-time decision, it was a continual decision. Giving him everything, giving him my pain, giving him my hurt, giving him my past, my history, giving him every part of my life. And then, giving him my, giving him my singleness when I when I was single. Then when I got married, it was giving him my marriage. It wasn't a new room for me to give him, but it was a new stage of life. And me continuing on with that original decision to surrender to him, to give him everything. Then we had kids, and I again had the chance to continue that decision and to surrender my kids to him. With different jobs to surrender to him as i face situations where my peace is is challenged where i feel anxious to surrender that to him not because those are rooms that i hadn't previously surrendered but they are actually things that maybe i hadn't encountered in the past so now i'm faced with them and i have the opportunity again to continue on the path that i had decided years ago each of those decisions isn't a new room or a new path it is this continuation of the original decision It's about inviting Jesus into everything. Recognizing Him as Lord of all. Giving Him authority and lordship. Putting Him on the throne of our lives. Not just saying, hey Jesus, you can come visit my tent, but this is where I want you to live. Come and dwell with me. At Christmas time, we talk about the concept of Emmanuel, God with us. And it's this concept of God coming and tabernacling, living in our tent. Not separate from, not just visiting, but taking up residence, making it his home, a place where he is comfortable. So how are we doing that with our lives? You see, if I refuse to surrender, regardless of the situation, if I refuse to surrender, I'm actually refusing to follow. I can't say I'm following Jesus and refuse to surrender to his lordship in my life. Our lives can't be compartmentalized and segregated like that. They're not a series of different rooms that Jesus has to conquer over the course of our lives. It is a house that we hand over to him when we choose to follow him. And from that point, we commit, no matter what comes, to pursue him with everything we have, to continually become more like him, You see, you can never become more like Jesus if you're still in the process of surrendering parts of your life. If you're holding back things, those are all areas where you're not allowing him lordship. You're just allowing him to be a visitor, not a resident. So how are we choosing to surrender and honor God with the best of what we have? Are we being like the Israelites in Malachi where we are just offering the leftovers, our leftover time? 
No, God, I will give if I have leftover finances after I've paid everything. But you know what I've seen is when I give first, I always have enough to cover what needs to be covered. When I give him my time, what I've found often is I will stress about what is coming tomorrow. But when I give him my time today, there is enough time to do what I need to do today. When I give him my life, he brings the transformation. Let me ask you this, what does Jesus deserve? What kind of sacrifice, what kind of offering does the King of Heaven, who gave up his life for you because he loves you so much, what does he deserve? If you answered everything, that's correct, he deserves everything. He deserves the highest level of purity, of holiness, of excellence. He deserves everything in my life, everything I can bring him, he is worthy of, and so much more. But this is what I have, so Jesus, here it is. That has to be our mindset. You see, and it is my pleasure, it is my great joy to bring him everything I have. Not just the leftover, not just the, the compromised areas, but everything. To bring him the best, to make him Lord, King of my life of my tent to say, this is the place I want you to reside, so come and live here with me. Make this your home. Make this place a place where you are comfortable. You see, in Revelations, we see a picture of what this looks like. And it is such a difference than what we see in Malachi. In Malachi, we see the people bringing sacrifices that are blind, that are, they are less than. They are compromised. They're not pure. They're not holy. They're not set apart. They're the leftovers that nobody else wants. And sometimes we can come to God and think, well, he should just be happy that I'm allowing him in my life. But we've missed the point that he is the king, the great I am, the ruler of heaven and earth. He is worthy of everything. Revelations chapter 4 highlights this beautiful picture of worship of what this is meant to look like in our lives. And in Revelations chapter 4, 8 to 11, it talks about what worship looks like before the throne of God. When we really see who Jesus is, what does worship look like? What does it look like to offer him a sacrifice? This is what it says. It says, Each of the four living creatures had six wings full of eyes all around and under their wings. They worshipped without ceasing, day and night, singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the was, the is, and the coming. Some translations say, the one who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to the one who is enthroned and who lives forever and ever, The 24 elders fell face down before the one seated on the throne and they worshiped the one who lives forever and ever. And they surrendered their crowns before the throne, singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your plan they were created and existed. We see this beautiful picture of worship where these elders, as they hear the creatures worshiping Jesus, the creatures with all their eyes to take in the glory and majesty of who Jesus is. And these elders are are there. And it, it says that the creatures are singing night and day. They continuously are worshiping. And every time they worship and give thanks and praise to Jesus, the elders fall down and they lay their crowns at his feet. The thing that is most valuable. You see, when you have a crown, a king has a crown, and a crown makes, a crown defines everything else the king has. What, What is the most valuable thing that a king has? It's his crown because it gives him authority. It's why the kingship starts at the coronation. And everything else flows from that point. And so here we have these elders who are wearing these crowns and are continuously 
Remember, the creatures are continuously praising and worshiping and giving glory and honor to Jesus. And so as they are doing that, these elders are continuously falling down and taking the most valuable thing they have and laying it at the feet of Jesus. What are we giving him, church? What are we offering him? Are we offering him corrupted sacrifices, the leftovers, or are we offering him the best thing we have to offer? Are we giving with excellence? Are we living in excellence? Are we offering our lives to Him with excellence and purity and holiness? Or are we compromising a little bit here, giving Him a little bit of the leftovers over here? And just saying, well, you should be happy with that. You should just be glad to be invited to the table. That is not how you treat a king. You honor a king, you bring him. If if a king comes to visit your house, you give him the best place, the place of honor. You give him the best that you have. You don't have a king over and then offer him boxed macaroni and cheese. You make him a feast of the best things you have, not the leftovers. You don't take last week's chicken out and say, oh, it's got some mold on it, it's it's cold, but here you go. That's not how you treat a king. So how are we giving our lives as living sacrifices? How are we giving him the best, the first? Not just in our finances, but in the way we live. You see, there's a principle here that when we encounter Jesus, it brings about passion in our lives. You could hear this message today and make it all about religious duty. Well, I'm going to go and I'm going to do the 10% and give this and give that. But without encounter, it just becomes religious duty. Without encountering the face of Jesus, just like the the elders that we read about and the creatures that we read about in Revelations, without seeing Jesus, encountering him and inviting him into your tent to live with you, encountering his presence, knowing who he is, experiencing that every day. The religious duty will try and find loopholes. That's what Jesus condemned the Pharisees for. They would give a tenth of their smallest spices but they wouldn't commit themselves to mercy and justice. And he doesn't say don't tithe in that portion of scripture. He actually says, okay, do those things, but don't neglect the other things. Don't neglect coming and sitting at the feet of Jesus. In Revelation chapter three, Jesus speaks to the seven churches. And in, in Revelation chapter three, he speaks to the church at Laodicea. Now you might know this, but just hold with me for a minute here. Jesus puts out three categories of people. Those who are hot, those who are cold, and those who are lukewarm. It's not a spectrum. It's not a a be anything you want. There's three categories that Jesus lays out. We can be hot. We can be passionate for Jesus. Encountering him, giving him the best, serving him with our lives. We can be lukewarm where we are just comfortable. Where we are just choosing what is best for us, what is our comfort. Or we can be cold, we can be apathetic, absolutely turned off to who Jesus is. Jesus actually says in this passage, I would rather you be hot or cold instead of in the middle. Because the thing about lukewarm is it is influenced by the temperature around it. That's how it becomes lukewarm. It lets the outside in in compromise. It doesn't influence the culture around it. When you have something hot, it influences the temperature around it. If you have something cold, it influences the temperature around it. But when you have something lukewarm, it is influenced by the culture around it. You see, passionate people are incredibly easy to recognize. There's no confusion when you meet somebody who is passionate about something. Usually because they won't shut up about it. They are excited about it. They want everyone to know about it. Passionate people will pursue what they're passionate about regardless of comfort. People who are cold about something, you can tell right away. They will tell you how much they don't like something. But lukewarm, lukewarm is like the religious, who they might follow the letter of the law. They would give because, well, the pastor said, give 10%. They would come to church because, well, that's just what we do. But their lives would not reflect the nature and character of Jesus as one who has surrendered everything to him. It would be more about them staying comfortable. And they would find eventually ways to get out of giving. Maybe they'd build a theology around it, a doctrine around it. They'd find ways to get out of serving. 
There are three categories. Where do we want to be? Who do we choose to be? You see, in the days of Malachi, God didn't need the sheep and the goats. It was about bringing Him honor and making Him Lord in those areas of our lives so that we could experience Him, His provision, His presence in those things. Sacrifices are meant to be pure and holy and spotless. Because they reflect a heart attitude of honoring who God is. Of giving Him the honor that He is due. Not robbing God of the honor that He is due. And today there's many things that compromise our sacrifice, our life of sacrifice. Maybe it's compromise to the world around us, to doing things the way everyone else does. Maybe it's just laziness. Maybe it's fear or complacency or comfort. Or maybe it's pride. There's, there's so many things that can compromise our sacrifice. And maybe for each person it's different. But it all has one result, and it's giving Jesus less than the honor that is due him. Living, giving him less than the best, giving him less than everything. You see, I am so thankful for grace, not because it's an excuse to live less passionate, but because it empowers us to live out passion. Grace says, I will come and I will live with you, not because you deserve it, not because you've earned it through your works, but because I love you so much. It's a free gift, getting what you don't deserve. It's not meant to leave us in apathy or complacency, to leave us comfortable. Grace is actually there to spur us onward so that when we fall, we don't just say, well, I guess this is where I am. Instead, we say, no, I'm getting back up and I'm going to keep pressing on because Jesus is worthy of everything. He's worthy of my life. He is worthy of my heart. He is worthy of everything I can offer him. And I want to bring him the best of the best. And the reality is this is the natural response of encountering Jesus. We become like him. We become passionate. And we, we see how amazing he is, how holy he is, how worthy he is. And how little we have to bring him. But to say, I will bring you what I have. This tent, it's not a mansion, it's just a tent but I will bring it all to you. Pride convinces us that our lives are like this mansion, this elaborate thing that Jesus should just be thankful to be a part of. But when we actually understand that all we have is this little tent, Jesus, here it is, how can you use it? And he will do incredible, amazing things. So what do we do? Number one, we go after encounter why the first part of our mission is to encounter Jesus because apart from encountering Jesus everything just becomes religious activity if it's not centered on who he is on being with him on giving him everything in our tent then we're just going to end up in compromise looking for loopholes trying to get out of giving him the best it has to be rooted in encountering Jesus Otherwise, you'll forget why you're doing it. The second thing that I want to challenge us to do is to give him what he is due. Invite him into your life. Give him everything. Give him your finances. Give him your time. Give him your families. Give him your energy. Give him your days. But don't just give him the scraps. Give him the best. Give him everything you have because he is so worthy. It's not a complicated process. I'm not saying it's not hard, that it's not hard for us to surrender, to hand over lordship of our lives. Of course, because we want to be kings. We think, we want to think that we have something so amazing going on. So often we want the benefits of heaven. But Jesus is the benefit of heaven. Is God coming to live in our tents, to come live with us? 
How sad that we would relegate to him to a corner saying you're allowed to visit. You're allowed to have the scraps when he is worthy of so much more. And I really believe that if Jesus isn't everything for you, if you're not sold on him, then you're not going to find heaven to be all that great. The benefits of heaven are that Jesus is there. It's his presence. It's in his presence that we experience healing and freedom and deliverance. It's in his presence. And he'll do it like that. It's not about... It's not about some ritual or some prayer we have to pray. It's about inviting him in and giving him everything. He loves everyone. But he resides where he's invited and made to feel welcome. So what are you offering him today? What are you offering him this week? When you look at your life, what are you offering him? Today, maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for many years. But you would say, I haven't actually surrendered to him. Then today is your chance to actually follow Jesus. Not just say you follow him. Not just call yourself a Christian. But to surrender to him. It is so worth it. Because he is so worthy of our lives, of everything we have to bring. Maybe you're hearing this message for the first time and you've never thought about Jesus coming and living with you. You thought of God as being some distant, far off, unknown being, force, spirit. He is so incredible. He is knowable. He wants to be known by you. That's why he sent Jesus, so that you would know the love of God for you, that you would know how much he desires to have relationship with you. That is the good news, that God is not against you. He is for you, and he wants to live in your tent. Will you let him today? So here I want to lead us in a prayer of surrender. It's not about the prayer. You can say these words and not surrender anything. But it is about giving up your life. Surrendering over to him everything. And that's something that you will do today. And if you make that choice today, you choose to do it tomorrow and the day after. And every day after that. With every situation and circumstance that you come against that you come up into as you continue on in life, you make that choice again. So let's pray. Jesus, we surrender to you today. You see our hearts. We want to give you everything. We don't want to give you the leftover or the scraps. We want to give you the best. And we just repent today from any time. We just just turn away from any time where we've given you less. Where we've puffed ourselves up and minimized who you are. Tried to accessorize with your presence. Jesus, this is all about you. You are so worthy of everything we have to give. So here is our tent. Just right now as we're praying, just put your hands out. If, If this is for you, if you want to do this today, just put your hands out. Give God an offering. Just put your hands out. Jesus, we just give you this tent, everything we have. And we welcome you in. We ask that you would transform it into a place where you are comfortable, where you are welcome. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Let's be a people who choose to give everything for the one who is so worthy.